All right. Uh, hopefully, it's not a news that next Friday is a quiz. Uh, not quiz. Yeah, it's a quiz. Yeah. So the quiz is on linear algebra and convex functions, convex sets, uh, differentiation of multivariate functions or functions of multiple variables. So uh, make sure you prepare accordingly. Uh, it's based on the review lectures on day one, lecture one, lecture three, lecture two, and lecture three. So you can find any reference for that uh, and read the stuff. Uh, everything is already provided. So everything that I talked about is already there in Bertzeker's appendix. So you can definitely go and take a look at the appendix in order to prepare yourself. And the questions are going to be easy. Usually my uh, philosophy is I should be able to complete the quiz or whatever exam I'm taking, uh, I'm giving. Uh, I need to be able to complete it in one fifth of the time that it's going, that's assigned for the course, okay? So since you have 50 minutes for the quiz, I should be able to complete it in 10 minutes. So that's a good quiz, okay? Uh, you shouldn't complain that it's too long or too, too easy, okay, that's the number I have. So I started with three, and people started complaining about it, so I went to four. People still complain about it, so now I'm down to five. <laughs> okay, so don't, don't complain about it now. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, okay, so I'll be able to do it in 10, so I'm, I'm able to do the quiz in 10 minutes, so you are getting 50 minutes for it, so I guess that's fair from my standards, okay. Uh, so today we are going to talk about Lagrange multiplier theory uh, and the, the idea is that so far we have talked about unconstrained optimization where there are no constraints. Then we talked about optimizations over convex sets. So the set X was a convex set, but in many application uh, that you may encounter uh, you may not have a convex set, and you may not have an unconstrained optimization problem, okay? So in this case, or in, in many cases, you will have optimization problems where you are doing optimization over a surface. So consider this problem. You want to minimize fx such that norm of x is equal to 1, okay? So you are doing optimization over the surface of a sphere, and it's not a convex set, and it's not an unconstrained optimization problem. And we want to develop tools to solve problems of this type, okay? And maybe some other, some other constraint, x greater than or equal to zero. <clears throat> okay, so you may have equality constraints, you may have inequality constraint. So we want to try and develop tools and methods to solve optimization problems of this type, okay? So in general, we will write the optimization problem in the following format. Minimize fx such that hi of x is equal to 0 for i equals 1 to m. Okay? That's the general optimization problem that we'll be concentrating for the next uh, couple of weeks. Now, what does this constraint look like? So, usually, This was your h1 of x equal to zero. So some surface, some curved surface uh, in Rn. And then you would have another constraint. And then you have another surface that looks like this. So this is my h2 of x equal to 0. Okay. All right. 
Okay, so this is my surface number one, h1 of x equal to zero. This is my surface number two, h2 of x equal to zero. Okay, and this is the point, or rather a, a, a curved line, at which both the surfaces intersect, and we want to optimize this function over this curved line. Okay, that's the idea. So this is the line at which both h1 of x is equal to 0 and h2 of x equal to 0, this line. Okay, and it's not a convex set, it's not a concave set, I mean not concave set, but it's not a convex set and it's not an unconstrained set. Okay, it's a constrained set and we want to, uh, it's a curved line and we want to be able to minimize that function over this curved line. So that's what we want to study in today's class. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so the problem statement is clear. Uh, let's look at one such surface. And I pick a point X. What are the feasible directions at this point x. Okay. Any thoughts? Yeah. So it has to reside on that surface, right? Yes, so that's right, yeah. It can't go up. It can't go up, it can't go down, yeah. It has to be on the surface. It'll be a yeah, it'll be a curved feasible direction, right? So if you want to get to any point on the surface, then the feasible direction has to be some sort of curved line. But it's, uh, it's kind of problematic to think about curved lines, so let's allow for some small errors, okay? Let's allow for some small errors so that our feasible direction would be a straight line as long as this error from the surface is very, very small, negligibly small, close to this point x, okay? So how would I describe these directions d that are not quite on the surface, but very, very close to the surface if you're close to, if you're not too far from x, point x? How would you define it? Let's gradient. Uh, okay, so, where, so what does gradient of HI of X looks like? Anyone remember? So if you have a surface which is, param which is defined by a function of this type, in which direction does the gradient point to? Sorry? Orthogonal to the surface? Yeah, that's right. So the gradient would point in this direction, okay? This is my gradient of HI of X, okay? So if you have a surface given by a function, you take the gradient of that function that gives you the normal to the surface, okay? Normal to the surface, that's well known and we have used it perhaps in several uh, other physics classes and so on. Okay, so this direction D is going to be orthogonal to this normal, and so we say that V of X is the set of, it has a specific name. first order feasible variations. Set of first order feasible variations and is given by D such that gradient of HIX transpose D is equal to zero for all I equals to one to M.
set of first order feasible variations at x at x all right so any d that you can draw at x would be orthogonal to the normal and that's exactly what that condition says if you come to this particular picture pick a point x the first order feasible directions would be in this direction and in this direction of course if these surfaces were linear then the first order feasible variations are exactly the same as the feasible directions that we talked about in the previous class but in this case because they are curved surfaces no matter which first order feasible direction you take it could be out of that constraint region but that's fine as long as this error is very very small close to the point x okay is this concept clear to everyone there is another definition so x is regular point if and only if gradient of h1 at x gradient of hm of x are linearly independent okay so in this particular problem let's look at a point x which is right here uh where is the gradient of h1 of x that's normal to this surface so let me it is okay so i am at point x the normal to h1 of x would be in this direction the normal to h2 of x would be in this direction so this is gradient of h1 of x gradient of h2 of x and these two are linearly independent in this particular problem okay and therefore this point x is a regular point in fact all points on this surface on this curve they are all regular points because the two surfaces are not uh if you look at the normals they are all in different directions they are not in the same direction let's look at another example where x is not a regular point consider two dimensional case you have one circle you have another circle so this is my h1 of x equal to 0 this is my h2 of x equal to 0 they both intersect only at one point but the normals to both surfaces are in the same direction this is gradient of h1 of x and gradient of h2 of x they may have different magnitude but they are all pointing in the same direction therefore this point is not a regular point okay yes can we solve this these kind of problems if the gradients at the intersection are not linearly independent so x is not a regular point so can we solve such problems then it we don't have any general purpose methods mm -hmm. for solving those problems because all general purpose methods would automatically assume that x is a regular point 
okay. Okay. So, if two surfaces are just touching each other, but not really intersecting each other, then you will not have a regular point. You will only have a regular point if they are actually intersecting each other, okay, not just touching each other. So, in this case, the two surfaces are just touching at one point, or it could be a curve if you think of them as cylinder, right, then it would be a straight line but they are just touching at that straight line and therefore it's not a regular point. In this case, the two surfaces are actually intersecting with each other and therefore all the points are regular because the normals are pointing in different directions. Okay? So, so two concepts that we need to remember when we are talking about optimization over such surfaces or curves. The first is first order feasible variations, which is uh, a generalization of the notion of feasible directions that we talked about in the case of convex sets or in the case of unconstrained optimization. And then this regular point is something new that has appeared here because you have multiple surfaces who may or may not be intersecting with each other. So we need to make sure that that uh, assumption is that uh, all the points in the set should be a regular point or at least the optimal solution must be a regular point. So if there are further questions about it, I can take it now, otherwise I'm going to erase most of the things on the board. Yes? But you said the optimal solution and every point that we're, we go to has to be regular? Well, so the Lagrange multiplier theory would require the optimal solution to be regular, uh, but if all points are regular, then it makes your life much easier because you don't have to check for regularity when you are applying Lagrange multiplier theory. Okay? Yes? Oh, uh, for them, uh, for that the name is geodesic. Okay, it's a it's a name from differentiable manifold. So if you have a manifold that has some sort of differentiability structure, and you can define inner products between two vectors, then these first order, not the first order, but the feasible directions, which for what we were talking about, would be called a geodesic. So if you look at the surface of sphere. There is no straight line direction, right? So locally everything looks straight, but if you look at global scale, nothing is straight line. So therefore, the aircrafts actually fly along geodesics, which are the shortest path between two points on the surface of sphere, and not along some straight line. So the geodesic basically generalizes the concept of straight lines to curved surfaces. Okay, so if I just zoom in to an small yes. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So, so it exactly. Is this like a tangent space? Uh, this is yeah. This is like a tangent space. Yeah. This would be like a tangent space. Okay. I'm going to raise any any other questions. Okay. Okay. Lagrange multiplier theorem. It's a necessary condition for optimality. So it seems like necessary condition is not leaving us. So X star optimal so local minimum and regular implies there exist lambda star in Rm such that gradient of Fx star plus gradient of Hx star lambda star is equal to zero. And D transpose
Yes. Didn't we define a Lagrange multiplier for each constraint? Yes, so there is Lagrange multiplier resides in Rm. There are m constraints and you have m Lagrange multipliers. So here would be a transverse gradient Hx. Yeah, so let me, let me show you what gradient of Hx star looks like. So gradient of H at X star is gradient of H1 at X star as the first column, gradient of HM X star as the last column. Okay, so this is a matrix in our n cross m. Okay. So this is this is by the way this is same as writing gradient of f x star plus summation lambda i star gradient of h i x star i equals one to m is equal to zero. Okay, so these two are the same equations, no difference. <coughs> okay, so this is the first order necessary condition for optimality. This is the second order necessary condition for optimality. First order says that there exists a set of Lagrange multipliers lambda 1 star all the way to lambda m star such that this condition holds. And this one says if you look at the value of uh, d transpose second derivative of this quantity multiplied by d for all first order feasible variations, uh, it's going to be non-negative. It's very similar to positive definiteness condition that we had talked about for unconstrained optimization. Positive semi-definiteness condition. So that's this condition, okay? Usually when people talk about Lagrange multipliers, uh, they almost always stop at this, uh, at this equation, but you always have to remember the second equation as well. So second order necessary conditions are part of Lagrange multiplier theorem. Okay, so let's look at the picture once more. I am at this point x star. This is my gradient of h1. This is my gradient of h2. And what this, what this implies is that gradient of fx star lies in is the linear combination of the gradient of h i x star, which means that the gradient of f x star would lie in the plane spanned by the two gradients. So this would be my gradient of f x star. Okay. So so you are at point x star. You look at the two normals, right? You can span a plane at that particular point your gradient of the function at x star would be within that plane, okay? That's the first equation. And the second equation says, if you move in this direction, first order feasible directions, then this particular quantity is going to be non-negative. Why should there be this term, we will see it in the proof when we talk about the proof of this result. Okay. All right. Again, the gradient of the function at x star would lie in the plane spanned by the gradient of h1 of x star and the gradient of h2 of x star. That's exactly what this equation is saying. Okay, so gradient of f x star and gradient of h i x stars are not linearly independent anymore. All right. So what is d here? D? Set of first order feasible variations at x star. Oh, okay. 
given by this expression. Okay, for all d in B x star. Okay, so we are going to prove this result now in the class and we will use a lot of concepts from lecture one and two in order to prove it. And we are going to be taking the penalty approach. The idea of penalty approach is I want to minimize, I want to construct a function that I want to minimize where I don't restrict myself to staying on the surface, I could go out of the surface as long as I'm willing to pay a penalty for it, okay? So I'm going to define fk of x as fx, which is my original objective, plus k over two norm of hx square, that's my penalty term, plus alpha over two, x minus x star square. All of these norms are two norms, okay? So this is my penalty. This is alpha greater than zero implies strong convexity. Okay, I want to prove these two results and the idea is I want to construct a function so that I penalize violating the constraint. So if hx was non-zero, this term will kick in, it will be positive and it gets multiplied by k, okay? So as I take k, uh, I, as I let k go to infinity, the penalty for violating the constraint would dominate all other terms, okay? And so you would be forced to be on the constraint surface. And this term is to make sure that the function is locally strongly convex, which means that even if your function you started with looked like this, because of this strong convexity term, which is curved, you will have a function that looks something like this. Okay, so all the flat regions, let me put, make sure it's differentiable since we are talking about differentiable function. Uh, so all the flat regions would become curved and you will have a strongly convex function at least locally around x star, okay? And I'm going to define a constraint set S which is x in Rn such that x minus x star is less than epsilon, for epsilon sufficient, less than equal to epsilon. So that's a closed and bounded set. I want to minimize fk of x uh, such that x is in this set capital S and let xk be the minimum.
okay so what am i doing here i draw so i have x star this is my constraint surface this is my h of x equal to 0 i define this function fk of x indexed by a natural number k and i'm going to let k go to infinity eventually but at this point of time it's just a finite natural number k and i define a function over this region this is my s set s so the radius of this particular set is epsilon and it's a closed and bounded set because i have equality sign here so it's not an open set anymore and i want to minimize this function over this particular set s okay and i'm going to get x1 i'm going to get x2 i'm going to get x3 by minimizing this function for various values of k and most of these points initially are not going to be on this constraint surface where hx is equal to 0 i'm going to be out of the surface but i guess all of you would argue intuitively that as i let k go to infinity this term will become too comp too too high if you violate the constraint so as you let k go to infinity eventually these points are going to come closer and closer to this uh, constraint surface hx equal to 0 okay and the hope is that this xk would eventually converge to x star okay intuitively and that's exactly what i want to prove next that xk converges to x star that's the first result i want to prove moreover since since xk would converge to x star eventually it means that xk would be an unconstrained minimum point of fk for k sufficiently large so maybe k after 1 billion uh, xk would be an unconstrained minimum of fk so of course x3 in, for instance in this case is an unconstrained minimum uh, for f3 right so eventually as you go inside the set you become this point would become an unconstrained minimum of the corresponding function and that would imply that the first derivative of fk would go to zero and the second derivative would be positive semi definite okay so the first derivative being equal to zero would imply this result the second derivative being positive semi definite would imply this result okay so that's what we will be getting at uh, how would that uh, point xk be an unconstrained minimum because uh, x uh, because fk we are optimizing inside s that's right so so as i mentioned xk would eventually converge to x star so as soon as you go inside the set then it's an unconstrained minimum because the feasible directions are all the directions around the point so if we choose a starting point for that equation that is inside the set we always have an answer that's right yeah so maybe x1 x2 x3 all of them will be on the surface but eventually since xk is converging to x star you will go inside the set in which case xk would become an unconstrained minimum of fk because the set of feasible directions would be all the directions at that particular point okay maybe this 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 graph doesn't illustrate that so let me try to illustrate it so this is my x1 this is my x2 this is my x3 this is my x4 this is my x5 and so on so x1 x2 x3 are unconstrained minimum because the set of feasible directions are limited at each of these points so these are constrained minimum but x4 becomes unconstrained because then you can go in any direction so the derivative must vanish at this point okay so let's try to prove the first result which is xk converges to x bar and i'm going to prove that uh, xk converges to x star so i'm going to prove it in several steps so step one if xk converges to x bar then hx bar equal to 0 step 2 
fx star is less than or equal to fx bar and fx bar is strictly less than, well, f fx, well, uh, this would imply that x bar is equal to x star. And then the step three is <coughs> xk converges to x star. So let's look at each of these steps separately. Okay, so proof of step one. What is fk of x star? f of x star? So what is fk of xk? Any thoughts? Fk is less than fk x star because xk is the optimal point and x star is just any other point in the set which is equal to f of x star, right? So why, why should the first claim be true? So fk of x star is f of x star plus k over 2 this is 0, h of x star is equal to 0 because x star lies on the constraint surface and this is equal to 0, okay? So the first one is valid. In the second one, this is the optimal point, this is some other point in the set, so this inequality must be valid. So this would imply that f of xk plus k over 2 norm of hxk square plus alpha over 2 norm of xk minus x star square is less than or equal to f of x star. Okay? So this term is bounded, this term is bounded. If h of xk was converging to a non-zero quantity, with k over 2, this is going to blow up to infinity. But the sum of these three bounded terms is bounded from above, okay? Let's go over the argument again. If xk converges to some point x bar, okay? So if, that's the hypothesis, Let's assume that xk converges to some x bar. Then this term is bounded. This term is bounded. The upper bound is bounded. But this term is positive, okay? And if h of xk doesn't converge to zero, then this term is going to blow up to infinity, okay? So it means that h of xk must be converging to zero. Okay, you can prove it by contradiction, which is if xk converges to x bar and hx bar is not equal to zero, then it leads to a contradiction. Okay, by that I get the conclusion that h of xk must be converging to zero as k goes to infinity. Okay, is that clear? No, I still see blank faces, so I don't know whether it's clear or not.
Yeah, right now we can, we, that's what we want to prove. Okay, so before we get to that, we first have to go through a series of steps. So the left side is going to be less than the right side. This is the left side, right? Yeah, this is the left side, okay. Okay, so the left side is going to be low, smaller than the right side. That's what we proved here, okay. So this must be going to zero, which means h of x bar must be equal to zero. So in all these cases, we have continuous and differentiable functions. So if xk converges to x bar, then h of x bar. h of xk also converges to h of x bar. So h of x bar is equal to zero. All right, so we got step one clear out of the way. How? So this term is bounded, this term is bounded, this term is going to infinity because k goes to infinity. k goes to infinity, okay? So if this goes to any constant, k multiplied by that constant will go to infinity. Okay, this is positive number. All right. So step one is out of the way. I'm going to erase this. Um, oh, actually, I don't need to erase this. Okay, let's look at step two. So x bar, it seems, lies on this surface, okay? So some point x bar, x bar lies on this surface. And this epsilon is very, very small. So x bar is close to x star. And what we have is x star is the optimal point. It's the local minimum on this surface, okay? by definition, because x star was the optimal point for fx, minimize fx as that hx equal to zero. Now x bar is a point on the surface, so therefore I have that f of x star must be less than or equal to f of x bar, okay? Once again, x bar satisfies h of x bar equals to zero, which means it's on the surface, but by definition, x bar, x star is a local minimum, so therefore the function value at x star must be lower than the function value of fx, uh, at x bar. Okay. So what we have proved as a result of step one and step two is that if xk converges to x bar, then x bar must be equal to uh, x star because I have because the I have that oh uh, wait a second so from here I have that f of x bar plus alpha over two norm of x bar minus x star is less than or equal to f x star okay I let the limit k go to infinity. I know this term is vanishing at k go to in, as k go to infinity, so all I'm left with is f of x bar plus alpha over two, x bar minus x star, less than or equal to f of x star. And then I have f of x star less than or equal to f of x bar, so I have these two inequalities, which means that x bar minus x star must be equal to zero. So that gives me this result composition of step one and step two. Okay. So we proved step one, okay, we got that h of x bar is equal to zero. Then we use this fact and let k go to infinity in this sequence to get this result where f of x bar plus some positive term is less than or equal to f of x star. And then I also have f of x star less than or equal to f of x bar, which means that x bar minus x star must be equal to zero. So this means that x bar must be equal to x star. Okay, that's the composite of step one and step two. So right now what I have proved is if assume 
that xk converges to some value, then that value must be x star. But I have yet not proved that xk converges to x, bar for, uh, x star for sure. Okay? So for that, I have to invoke some of the results we reviewed in, class, in the first lecture, um, which is the following result. I want to write it somewhere. So. So the result that I'm going to invoke, every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. That's the first result. And the second result I'm going to invoke is, so this is a bounded sequence. XK is a bounded sequence because it lies within this sphere. If every subsequence converges to the same point, then the original sequence converges. Uh, every subsequence, but this subsequence also has to be from that bounded sequence, okay? So these are the two results which we studied in, the, uh, in, in lecture one. We didn't really prove it, but, uh, but we had written it on the board and we had talked about it at length in that class. So let's look at how I'm going to apply it. So I know that this xk is a bounded sequence, so it must have a convergent subsequence. What I've shown is if that convergent subsequence converges to a point, which uh, I've extracted a convergent subsequence, then that point must be x star. And then I have this result where it's shown that if every subsequence converges to the same point, in this case x star, then the original sequence converges to that particular point. So that gives me this result, which is xk converges to x star. Okay. That's a lot of real analysis in one class, uh, but it's important. Okay, it's the important step. Any questions so far? Yes. So can I think of step two as like a squeeze theorem? Uh, yes, you can think of it as a squeeze theorem, okay. but in a multidimensional space. You are essentially squeezing this quantity, well, this quantity, as k goes from zero to infinity, and so you're squeezing it and making it equal to zero at infinity. Okay, so that's how you get this x bar minus x star equal to zero. All right. Uh, now, if xk converges to x, x star, then this implies that gradient of fk xk is equal to zero for k large, okay? By the argument that eventually this uh, sequence will be completely within the interior of this particular ball, and therefore xk would become an unconstrained minimum of the gradient of fk. Unconstrained local minimum, okay, not global, local minimum. Now what is gradient of fk xk? I have to derive the gradient of this expression, okay. Let's do that. What's the gradient? Can someone help me with the gradient? So first of all, I have the gradient of fx plus, sorry? Yeah, 
k gradient of hx hx and i hope i'm correct yes that's right plus what's the derivative of this function alpha x minus x star okay so i have this result which means that gradient of fx k plus k gradient of hx k alpha x k minus x star is equal to 0 for all k greater than equal to some capital K. Let me write this capital K in a different font. <coughs> Okay, so we have this result, and I'm going to end the class now. Uh, we'll talk about how to extract Lagrange multiplier and how to get the second order condition. Oh, so this is the, just the first derivative. There is also going to be second derivative, which is f k x k is greater than or equal to zero. And that will give us the second order condition. So we'll talk about both these conditions in the next class. Okay. All right. So thank you. I'll see you guys on uh, on Monday. Uh, there is uh, office hours Monday at 4:15 to 5:30 p.m. and then on Tuesday from 12 to 1 or maybe 11 to 12. PM, so make sure you use these office hours before the quiz one starts.